This talk was sponsored by the Center for Chinese Studies along with many other centers at the International Institute, the Centers for Comparative and International Studies, for South, uh, the Center for South Asian Studies, for Southeast Asian Studies, and the NAM Center for Korean Studies. So we also want to thank all of our uh, fellow centers uh, for co-sponsoring today's presentation. Today's presentation is going to be given by Mara Vistendal. She's a Beijing-based correspondent for science and the author of this new book, Unnatural Selection, Choosing Boys Over Girls and the Consequences of a World Full of Men. Her award-winning writing has also appeared in Harper's, Scientific American, Popular Science, The Financial Times, and Foreign Policy. She's proficient in both Chinese and Spanish, and she spent half of the last decade uh, in China covering everything from archaeology to the space program. She's a former journalism professor at Fudan University in Shanghai, and Ms. Vistendal sits on the advisory board of Round Earth Media, an organization founded to promote international journalism. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Mara Vistendal. Thank you. Hi, um, well, it's good to be here. Um, thanks for having me. It's, this is my first time in the University of Michigan, and I'm excited to see the campus and uh, get to know people here. Um, so I wrote this book. Um, it just came out this year. And I got the idea to write it while I was working as a journalist in China. And um, I'm sure you know the, the, the big story in China right now is development, that the country is moving forward at a, at a very rapid speed, um, lots of big changes. Uh, as, a, as a science journalist, I report on a lot of these. I mean, we spend my days reporting on breakthroughs in genomics and agriculture, um, on the space program. Um, and, all, and you know, there, there are lots of growing pains as well, but I think that the, the big story, more or less, is that China is moving ahead. And um, then, on the other hand, if you look at the population, you see a trend that's, that's essentially regressive. And, and, and what interested me is that these, these two things are happen, happening simultaneously. Um, so this is a map showing the um, sex ratio for children ages one through four um, by province. And um, the, the dark blue spots are kind of uh, danger zones. I mean, those are, that's where you see over 130 boys for every 100 girls. Um, countrywide, the sex ratio at birth from the, in the last census was 118 boys for every 100 girls, so almost a five to four, um, you have a huge gap. Um, and, and there are danger spots within some of these other provinces as well. Um, so then I, I got interested in how this is happening now, at this moment in, in Chinese history. Um, every time new surveys come out, the, the numbers are reported in the news, um, the, the Chinese press picks them up, the foreign press picks them up, um, but really without much explanation as, as to why. Um, I mean, we know this is a result of sex-selective abortion, mostly. Um, but, but beyond that, you know, why people are getting abortions based on the sex of the fetus is, is not so much explained. Um, so I, I wanted to understand a little bit more what was going on. The one-child policy is often given as an explanation in China, um, but I, that, didn't, that didn't do it for me. Um, the one-child policy has been around since 1980, and the sex ratio at birth really began to spike in the 1990s. And then at the same time, you have the same trend happening in other Asian countries as well. So India, Vietnam, Taiwan, South Korea, um, all have skewed sex ratios at birth. And then the, the, the really um, kind of astonishing thing is that if you look at um, other regions of the world, you're seeing the same trends cropping up there as well. So in the past um, 10 to 15 years, the, um, the Balkans, particularly Albania, has shown a very skewed sex ratio at birth. Um, so sex selective abortion happening there as well. And, and then also um, the Caucasus countries. So Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia. Um, in Armenia, one survey found a sex ratio at birth that was 
that was more skewed than China's. Um, so you have to remember it's a smaller country and that survey data may not be as accurate, but still that's a, that's a very big gap and it happened also very rapidly and, and really uh, from what I understand was unexpected for a lot of demographers. Um, this was seen as a kind of Asian problem and then suddenly you see these, these numbers happening in other places. So these are other countries that are also developing very quickly. Um, so I was trying to get a sense then, well, what's happening in, in all of these places? Is there some sort of global explanation for, for what's going on? Um, and so I, I started reporting by going to a county in northern Jiangsu province called Suining. Um, this is a place that was once agricultural. It, um, it's kind of the bread belt, or sorry, grain belt of China. Like, people produce grain, or rice, and and wheat. And and recently, it started industrializing. You have these really uh, kind of small scale factories setting up, and a lot of people are going to Shanghai, working as migrant laborers, um, working as kind of nannies, construction workers, and they're bringing back money, um, buying new houses. The, you just, and to, to some degree, actually, the, the pace of development is more stark in a place like Swaining than it is in in Shanghai or in Beijing, um, because you, uh, it's, it's happening very fast. Um, I, mean, I spoke with people there who said that they would go to Shanghai to work for two or three years, and they come back and they have trouble finding their their house because so much has changed. Um, but at the same time, Swaining has a sex ratio at birth of uh, 152 boys for 100 girls. Um, and you know, sometimes demography can seem like a, like a very, seem very abstract. And here it was, it was real. I mean, there were really boys everywhere. Um, this is an elementary school that I visited. Um, you see one girl in the, I don't know if I can, ah, there she is. One girl in the back and maybe one in the, in the other row and in a few, Probably clustered off to the other side of the classroom, but um, but by and large, this is this is what the uh, schools looked like around the area. Um, so I wanted to know then what do, what do the people in Swaining uh, think about this? Are they excited about all the boys being born? Are they um, worried about the future about the about their sons getting married later on, or are they um, are they disturbed on a more um, fundamental level, on a kind of humanitarian level, that that so few girls are, are being born. Um, and I'd, I went to Swaining at first with a photographer named uh, Ariana Lindquist, and uh, she'd worked in, in China for quite a while, and, and she'd been to Swaining a few times. And she suggested we, um, we spend time with a woman uh, who I call Liu Li in the book. Um, Liu Li was a, or is, a, is a strong, really independent woman. Uh, she's a leader in her church. Um, she uh, kind of calls the shots in her relationship. And, and um, we thought because she's sort of so outspoken, independent, she would be um, a good guide to what was happening in the community. Um, she, she wasn't afraid to cart around two foreigners for, for a, a few weeks. I mean, she kind of liked having us around. And um, so, so we spent a bit of time with her. I, um, she introduced me to her friends and relatives. Um, this is a cousin of her husband's who, of, who was really excited about having twin boys. I mean, he said he would walk down the street with a uh, son on each shoulder and people would um, look at him with envy and he, and he felt like a million dollars. And um, uh, she, she took me back to her village as well and I met women who'd been uh, brought by uh, traffickers from Western China to marry men who couldn't find um, local women. Um, this is something I'll get to later on. And I, I spent time with her own family. And then at the end of the trip, um, I, I realized I actually didn't know her that, that well in a, in a sense, um, we, because we were having dinner and um, she made a nice meal and we were having some warm beer, which is common in, 
in uh, rural China, and um, and we were talking about my reporting and and what, what I was looking into in Spain and and what I'd found. Um, and this phenomenon of, of sex selection happening. And, um, and she kind of stood up and she said, um, well, I aborted two girls. And uh, I, you know, I had two sex selective abortions. And, and that really threw me for a loop because I thought, you know, here's this independent woman um, clearly in charge in her household. And um, this is something that, that she is doing as well. And it, it changed how I'd thought about um, sex selection until that point. Um, it's, it's sometimes portrayed in the media as something that's happening in rural areas, in villages, and um, that uh, women are being forced by their husbands to do it, that um, it happens because of poverty. And, and then here was, was this woman who, you know, for whom that really wasn't the case. And, and she's saying, this is something I, I did as well. Um, and it actually turned out to be quite typical of what's happening across other countries where this is hap where, where sex selection is occurring. Um, now this is an issue, first of all, if you look at this uh, map of China again, it's an issue, first of all, because it means that sex selection could spread. So it could spread from the areas where the, where the wealthier, um, more middle class, more upper class, um, to poor areas. And in China, that's happened to some degree. I mean, if you see um, here, uh, Shanghai, Beijing are not so, um, the sex, sex ratio of birth is not so skewed anymore, except among the migrant population. And then, uh, still, and now it's it's moved in a bit west. Um, Henan, Hunan, Jiangxi, Guangdong, um, these these places are are where people are selecting for sex. And then still, the poorer provinces are relatively untouched. So Guangxi and and um, Guizhou, still there's not much selection happening. Um, so so it's an issue at at that level because it means this this could pick up in, in poor areas. And also in India, if you look at um, Delhi has traditionally been a place, not traditionally, so in the past 30 years, been a place where people really uh, have, have selected for sex. And the sex ratio is kind of extremely out of whack. Um, but the northeast of the country has sex ratios are, are more balanced. Um, so, so there's a threat of this spreading to new areas. And the, the, other, the other issue that this brings up um, that Lioli's case brings up, is that this is an, if this is something that a strong, independent woman is choosing to do, then the danger zones that you see, um, then the phenomenon of sex selection in general, is it's a sum of all these individual choices. Um, and I mean, that has implications for how you tackle the problem. Um, and. It, it also has implications for how we how we how we should think about it, and it says something I think about our own behavior um, in in the West. Um, and, and if we say it's a, it's a choice, so this is something people are choosing to do. It's not uh, the sort of choice that we mean when we talk about abortion. Usually, um, it's not the kind of choice that says. Uh, I'm pregnant and I don't want to be pregnant because I'm poor, or because I can't give a child a good home, um, because this is not the right time. Um, it's, it's a choice that says, I'm pregnant, but I want the baby only if it's a boy. Um, or, you know, to give an example that if that has been more, um, had more saliency in the West recently. I want a baby, but not if it has uh, certain conditions. Or an, an example that may may um, be more relevant in the future is that you know I want a baby, but only if he has blue eyes, if he's a boy, and if he's tall. Um, and and so it's this kind of choice. It's really a sort of consumerism that is crept into parenting. Um, and that's how I see it in 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 cases like. Uh, upper middle class, wealthy people in elites within developing countries um, practicing sex selection. And in that sense, it's very, very close to trends that have caught on in the, um, in the US recently. Um, this, 
In the US, it's sex selection happens as well. Uh, we don't have a skewed sex ratio at birth if you look at the overall population of the country. Um, if you break it down uh, by ethnicity, the, you, you do get skewed sex ratios. But we still select for sex. I mean, still, this is not, uh, not limited to any ethnicity. It's, in, in fact, the US has incredibly lenient uh, regulations governing sex selection. And I don't mean abortion because we have uh, very tight restrictions on abortion. But um, IVF is um, the way that we, we typically do it here. Um, so during in vitro fertilization, uh, when you, the sperm fertilizes the egg, um, you get to the point where you have uh, several celled en embryos. You can withdraw one cell, and you can test it for sex. Um, this is called pre-implantation pre genetic diagnosis, or PGD. And it's offered by fertility clinics here. And um, so this, this site, um, Gender Baby, is actually sponsored by a fertility clinic in California. Oops, let's go back. Um, it explains, you know, if you want to select for sex, how you go about doing it. Um, what are some of the benefits of having a boy? What are the benefits of having a girl? Uh, you can you can ask a doctor for advice. Um, if you go to the boy page, you learn that humans have been wanting boys for thousands of years. Um, that. Uh, kings wanted sons to carry on the, um, to inherit the throne, that your ancestors wanted boys. Um, you know, it's almost as if to say that you, your you don't worry, your ancestors wanted sons, it's okay, you, can, you should have a son as well. Um, I, but the thing is that your ancestors did not have the ability to get a son if they wanted to. Um, they, there, was, there were certainly attempts um, Aristotle actually prescribed tying off the left testicle if, um, if a man wanted a son. I, I don't know. I mean, he thought he believed that each, each testicle contained either male or female sperm. And um, this was how, how you did it. And I, I don't know how many men actually went through with that. But the idea was there. Um, the, you know, it's an ancient idea. But the thing is, we've only recently had the technology to control reproduction in this way. Um, now, if you go to the girl page on Gender Baby, Interestingly, you don't actually find a page explaining the benefits of having a daughter, explaining why girls are good. Um, instead, you get this page uh, describing family balancing. And this is a, a new term uh, created by the fertility industry, I believe, in the 1990s. And it's the notion that we have the right to children of both sexes. So if you have three girls and you want a boy, um, that's fine. You should be able to get that boy. You have three boys and you want a girl, you, you, can, you can have him. Sorry, you can have her. Um, so it's, a, it's actually not that, it's not that different from what happens in Asia and Eastern Europe in countries where sex-selective abortion is common. Um, typically, a sex ratio at birth doesn't spike until you get to the second or third birth. So most, most couples are waiting until they, only, until they already have one or two girls, and then, then they select for sex. Um, this, is, this is true in China, I mean, with the, the one-child policy, it has, there are a lot of exceptions to it, and one exception is that in many provinces, if you have a, a daughter first, you can try again for a son. Um, so it's even this kind of discrimination is sort of built into the policy. Um, we also have, I'm going to get back to talking about Asia, but I just want to continue in the US for, for, for just a minute. Um, we also have a term here that's cropped up in, I think, maybe just the past 10 years called gender disappointment. Um, so Elle magazine recently ran a feature on women who are disappointed with the sex of their baby and uh, go on Prozac after giving birth. Um, it's called, it's popularly called GD. And um, this was in, in this issue that featuring Katie Holmes. Um, 
What, what, is, what I found actually when I researched my book is that the fascination with sex selection and with controlling reproduction in the US actually went back uh, to the 1960s, and that that had implications for what would happen later on in in Asia and in Eastern Europe, um, and you know as it's the, the story of U.S. technology spreading throughout the rest of the world is an, is you know, not a new one, um, but it it it's true in this case as well. Um, this is an early ultrasound machine from. Uh, the 1960s. This is a 1965 cover of Life magazine. Um, the first thing, I mean, ultrasound was relatively recent at this point, couldn't do that much. Um, it wasn't until the early 1980s that we could see the sex of the baby with, with um, any accuracy and that those machines were mass produced and distributed throughout the developing world. Um, but Early on, there was a, you know, greeted with this fascination. Uh, and the first thing about this is that it's huge. And you know, I think it must have been a very daunting experience to be a pregnant woman and have this big sack of uh, fluid and then suspended over your belly. Um, but and the second thing is this headline uh, that you know, control of life, audacious experiments promise decades of added life, super babies with improved minds and bodies, and even a kind of immortality. So I think, you know, from, from the outset, even though really what ultrasound promised was, was uh, better maternal and child health, the fascination was focused on, um, on controlling reproduction, the idea that we would be able to control our, uh, the outcome of of sex, the outcome of reproduction to some degree. Um, and at the time, it, the, it, nobody, at least popularly, was thinking about ultrasound in connection with sex selection. They were looking at other technologies. Um, but there was, a, there was a fascination with sex selection at the same time, so also starting in the 1960s in, in the West. Um, this had to do more with population control um, than, any, than anything else. Um, it was, you know, as you may know, the 1960s was an era where population growth was very much on the agenda. It was a, it was a huge concern. Um, we had reliable projections for the, for, for the first time uh, from, from the UN, showing that, po that populations were growing rapidly. And at the same time, people were also living longer than ever before in the developing world because of advances in public health. Um, so there's a lot of money going into reducing birth rates uh, quickly and, and effectively, uh, especially in the developing world. There was a lot of concern about Asia in particular. Um, and you had money coming from uh, USAID, Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation. Um, Planned Parenthood was founded as a population control organization. Um, population Council was a, was a big uh, research organization. And um, especially in countries where the US had a lot of influence uh, at the time, political influence, like South Korea, Taiwan, India, uh, we were very actively um, promoting uh, all kinds of strategies. So this is a, this is a magazine from the, the Taiwan Family Planning Association um, in the 1962. Um, one of the strategies that was, on, that was actually put on the table at the time was sex selection. Um, so we had a, lots of research into birth control, um, sterilization, um, abortion. I mean, everything, really the, the, the whole gamut, everything was, was tried. Also just propaganda promoting smaller families. Um, but sex selection was was an idea as well. You know, and, and the idea there was that population organizations had done research showing that one of the reasons that people in the developing world uh, continued to have children was that they wanted a son. Um, so the, the idea then emerged, then why not guarantee them a son 
on the first try um, or second try. And I, mean, I think you, know, you have to remember this is the era of control of life, uh, fascination with, with science, but in this sort of controlling, manipulative way. Um, the, uh, the biological revolution was underway. And so this idea was, oh, let's, you know, let's just give them a son. Um, so this is Sheldon Siegel. He was the medical director of the Population Council at the time. And um, the, the sex selection idea, it went from being um, you know, just something people were batting about to something that the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development was hosting seminars on. Um, so he led a session at a 1969, uh, so it was a seminar on, on uh, population controls and family planning strategies in general, but he led a, he led a session within that seminar on, on sex selection. Um, he actually under his, um, at that session, under his leadership, the, the delegates decided that this was one of the methods that was particularly desirable. So, you know, not only was it a, a method that was on the table, but it was one that, that was favored. And it was seen as even ethical um, by some people. Um, and I think, you know, the, 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 it was against a backdrop of all sorts of coercive strategies being tried. Um, this is a time when six million men were sterilized in India, when uh, women were being uh, encouraged to have abortions, were being in, um, encouraged or even forced to, have, to be sterilized. Um, so it was, a, you know, against that backdrop, sex selection seemed to, to some people a good idea. Um, Sheldon Siegel had actually spent a few years at, in Delhi at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, um, which is India's top medical school. He founded the Department of Reproductive Medicine there, and he taught, um, he taught students there how to determine sex in humans. It was not... Um, not yet fetal sex determination, but it was a, the method he taught was a kind of precursor to that. Um, the AIMS, that medical school, later became the site of hundreds of uh, sex selective abortions in the 70s. Um, doctors brought in, um, they offered poor women in Delhi the opportunity to learn the sex of their fetus for the first time. I mean, this was really the, the introduction of sex selection to India. And, and then they charted whether uh, the women aborted based on sex. It turned out that they, they did when, it, when the fetus was a girl. And um, uh, then wrote up this... Um, study as a, as a um, great method of population control. So there was a sort of, you know, this was the department founded by Sheldon Siegel, had received a lot of funding uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation as well, millions of dollars, and um, there, there, there was a, a connection. So sex selection was not something that just sort of happened, uh, started happening in Asia without, without um, Western scientists knowing about it. Um, so the appeal, I think, of, of this strategy, I mean, that's the time when you had all these, these more coercive strategies being introduced, was that it was voluntary. So, it's, so to go back to that notion of individual choice, of um, having control over reproduction, uh, I think people foresaw that it would be something that, or the scientists who proposed this foresaw that it would be something that parents would want. Um, they would not have to be forced to use it. They would actually, you know, maybe really appreciate having this ability. Um, in 1973, there was a, uh, a microbiologist named John Postgate uh, who wrote a cover story for the British magazine New Scientist on um, what he called the man-child pill. Uh, so his idea was that, oops, his idea was that um, 
people needed a pill to um, women. It was a pill that women could take bef before sex to ensure that any children that resulted would be male. Um, and for him, the great appeal with this was that it was voluntary. And 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 he wrote, you know, countless millions of people would leave, leap at the opportunity to breed male, and no compulsion or even propaganda would be necessary to encourage its use. But he also, uh, John Postgate also recognized that there would be drawbacks to a world where men outnumbered women. Um, and I, what I found interesting was that not only did, did people think this was a great strategy, but they also recognized that there would be side effects. Um, I mean, they, they, in the end, they thought, they thought the, um, the benefits outweighed the, the side effects. I guess that was their analysis. Um, but in the same New, New Scientist article, uh, John Postgate wrote, it is probable that a form of perda would become necessary. Women's right to work, even to travel alone freely, would probably be forgotten transiently. Polyandry might well become accepted in some societies. Some might treat their women as queen ants, others as rewards for the most outstanding or most determined males. So it seems like a good way to segue into what some of the effects of, of uh, sex selection uh, have been or, or will be um, today. Uh, one, one is that if you have years in which many more boys and girls are born, eventually you have many more men than women and um, projected 15% of men in China by the 2020s, and 15% of men in Northwest India uh, will not have female counterparts in the population uh, by this, well, the 2020s for both countries. Um, demographers call these men surplus. Uh, I think it's, it's a bit, it sounds a bit crass, but that's, that's the term for a man who does not have a have a theoretical female counterpart. I mean, it's, you can't really pinpoint who is surplus and who is not surplus. Um, but there are many men who who will have trouble finding uh, finding wives if they want them. Um, in China, already has a booming industry in uh, mar of marriage agencies uh, for for various reasons. I mean, this is one I visited in Swaining. Um, where um, the director was actually, she was actually very uh, concerned about the gender imbalance, and she, I mean, she thought it would be a big problem, and she said she was already having trouble finding uh, wives for some some men. Um, but these are, these are essentially dating agencies. Um, the the goal is, you know, they they talk a little bit more about marriage, but but the but the goal is to find people partners. Um, and you see now in villages in China, even the, these sort of black ads, um, they're called, like characters stenciled on walls, um, advertising marriage agencies. Uh, in, in a lot of places, these are, these are quite common. And uh, in South Korea and Taiwan, where men have, um, where sorry, sex selection has been happening since the early 1980s, um, and and because of some other trends as well, there there's a large proportion of rural men who are having trouble uh, finding wives. A lot of women have left, and then if you add sex selection on top of it, it's um, it's a big uh, issue for them. Uh, so because they have a bit more money, they are able to go to abroad and find wives. Um, the, there are agencies that set up um, marriage tours, they're called, um, where a man can pay around $10,000. He can get a um, flight to Vietnam and room and board and, and also a wife on the, on the other end. Um, I mean, it's, it's really not... It's like the mail order bride industry here. It's not, you know, any better or worse. I would say, except uh, for the difference that it's much more common. And uh, I mean, it's it's like your brother and your best friend and your um, 
the guy down the street all getting mail order brides. And um, then the women setting up even communities. And there's a little Saigon in, outside Taipei now. And um, this, uh, this couple is, uh, I met them outside Taichung in, in Taiwan. Um, Win Ti Mai Chao was 20 when they got married and um, had a, an elementary school education and um, had never, she'd never really left her, um, been farther than Ho Chi Minh City and, and you know, had not seen much of the world at all. Uh, and then she, she married uh, Cheng Ting Huang, who is uh, 31. He, he is a farmer, but actually pretty educated, pretty worldly uh, Taiwanese guy. And um, they did not speak the same language when they got married. I think, I think this photo says a lot. I think it was very um, difficult uh, for, for both of them, maybe especially for her. Uh, and um, I met them. Uh, a few years later, they 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 were doing all right, but I, I think for for many couples, it's 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 quite hard. Um, for the families uh, who uh, many families essentially sell their daughters, um, so the they take the money. Um, the ten thousand dollars, most of it goes to the agency. The family maybe gets one or two thousand um, dollars, but that's enough actually. That that uh, Vietnamese sociologists have done studies on this and. They found that the uh, families who have daughters abroad in the in the Mekong Delta, most of the women coming from the Mekong Delta, um, have more uh, motor scooters. They're more likely to own motor scooters, cell phones, uh, TVs. Um, I mean, you name it. They're they're doing better than their neighbors. So there's a there's some money being made off of this trade, um, this marriage trade. Um, it's I mean, it's sadly, I think, led to a world in which, um, which the more middle class, wealthier people, uh, people in eastern China, people in northwestern India, are having uh, boys, and then poor families are then supplying them with women, and and I think that's a that's a very sad effect. Um, there are there are a number of horror stories associated with this trade as well. Uh, there was a famous case in Vietnam of 220 women being held in seven hotel rooms, waiting for men to come uh, view them. Uh, they're they're kind of they're indentured against their um, the amount of time that they're held. So if they sit on the shelf for longer, they cost more. Um, they, there, there was a case in Taiwan of two Vietnamese women being uh, put up for sale on eBay. Um, there was a lot of outcry about these, about these cases. But it, um, yeah, there's a lot of abuse. Um, and then the, there are also incidences of women being uh, trafficked, uh, kidnapped. You know, not almost. Ostensibly being sold by your parents is also a, a form of trafficking, but but men, women who, who are tricked, who, who don't go willingly. Um, in This is the, the most recent trafficking in persons report from the US State Department, and it mentions the skewed sex ratio in China as a, as a cause of trafficking in and around um, the China. Um, So I think in the end, there, of course, so these big hum side effects for, for women now, you have this kind of double discrimination of, first of all, fewer women being born. And then for those women who are born, uh, especially in rural areas and in poorer countries, they're more at risk of being trafficked, more at risk of being sold. Um, they're, you know, for some women, for women in, in more urban areas, wealthy areas, this may be, you know, they may have a better pick, uh, you know, more guys to choose from if they, when it comes time to get married. But for, for many women, they really uh, disadvantage as a result of, you know, there being fewer of us. Um, so, you know, that's one issue. But then in the, in the end, maybe there won't be, um, there won't be enough women 
for all the men. So we will have also a society where men significantly outnumber women. Um, this is a sort of dystopic Indian film called uh, Matrubuni Umi. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And it's, the plot was that it, you had a um, village where uh, people kept selecting for boys. Eventually there are no girls left, no women left. Uh, so this father has five sons and they're trying to figure out what to do. Um, eventually he buys a uh, woman for his five sons uh, from, from another area and they share the sons share the woman. Um, this is something that's happening in very isolated cases. Um, it, it's a bit, it's, I wouldn't say it's common by any means. Um, but uh, here you see actually John Postgate's prediction of uh, polyandry, um, men, uh, women married to multiple men. And, um, um, you know, it's not, uh, not as, as fun as, as, uh, as some people might think. Um, this is an issue for society as, as well, potentially. I mean, it's really difficult to know what will happen, right? Because we don't, we've never had a society um, where, where the sex ratio is as skewed as, as it will be in parts of the developing world. Um, and, and, you know, demography is also, the history of demography is full of lots of um, conjecture uh, or, and, and uh, maybe sensationalism, too, about what could come. Um, and, but we do know, we do have this example from American history of the Wild West, um, which is, you know, it's not a perfect example by any, by any means, but it is, um, interesting in the, f in the fact that men significantly outnumbered women. Um, you had, and it wasn't, I mean, the Wild West was not as romantic as, as uh, Hollywood Westerns might make it seem. You had actually uh, a lot of disease, a lot of crime, uh, murder, murder rates were soaring. And, and um, if you look at sex ratios at the time, I actually have seen a, a sex ratio map of, of um, the the West at the time that it looks pretty similar to a, the sex ratio the child sex ratio map for for China now um, in California you had three men for every two women uh, this was 1870 uh, Nevada you had three it was three to one Idaho was four to one uh, Western Kansas was seven to one um, and there were actually reformers at the time who thought that the solution was to ship in women. Uh, there was one woman who just who uh, named Eliza Farnham who got the idea to gather a ship of women from from the East Coast and um, w women who had recommendations by the from their preacher that was the requirement and um, <laughs> sail sail around Cape Horn and then end up in in California and in the end she couldn't find anybody who wanted to go uh, but <laughs> um, in any case uh, there there. It's, it's hard to say, but there will probably be um, societal implications, and I think that's something that um, governments are, are starting to, to deal with. I mean, I think the, the Chinese government, the Indian government are, are both um, concerned about the, the skewed sex ratio. Um, and, and one thing that's cited now is the potential societal effects. Um, so, um, recently, there's, there's been a lot of good news, actually, uh, when it comes to sex selection and to the, the attention that it's getting. Um, the World Health Organization came out with a report just in June. Um, this is an interagency statement signed by several other UN agencies, um, also the United Nations Population Fund, uh, the Office of the High Commission on Human Rights, um, the UNICEF, they all signed on to this uh, statement. Um, so that's a start, actually. There have been, um, I think there's been a lot of research coming from the UN, but not a lot of action on uh, sex selection. And, and um, it's, there's definitely room for a lot more. Um, the World Bank, uh, recent World Bank Development Report, it was released, I think, a few weeks ago, and it also cited uh, skewed sex ratios of, of um, a skewed sex ratio at birth 
as a, as a big concern um, when it comes to the status of women. In, in other countries, and, and I mean that's a that's a that's a big step because you often see reports looking at women's rights that completely ignore the sex ratio at birth, and it's something that should be factored in. Um, and then the Council of Europe actually um, just came out with a report on sex selection in the Caucasus countries, and there's not that much known about it. Um, I went to Albania for in my research, but there's really hasn't been that much uh, on the Caucasus countries, and and I th and there's been some den denial too on the part of um, uh, governments, to so so that's a that's a good first step, um, but still there's no. I found in these reports not much focus on the technology and where it's going, and on the the ways in which sex selection is a global issue and is a very kind of contemporary issue um, that that has to do with our our you know this notion of control over reproduction, and um, this is. I mean, the history <laughs> has shown that it's much better to consider the effects of technology as it's in, you know, before it's introduced or as it's introduced rather than after, um, afterward. And to some degree, it's, it's hard to know, but, but with, with sex selection, I think we do know quite a bit about this. Um, so, again, the U.S. developed PGD, developed, uh, well, contributed to developing uh, IVF, and now has very, uh, very lenient regulations governing it. Um, it's, you're not allowed to select for sex during IVF in Europe, most of Europe. Um, and uh, clinics offering PGD for sex selection are being set up in the developing world. Um, this is, um, uh, this is an, from an Indian um, a fertility clinic that offers PGD. Um, this is, I was told, how people are selecting for sex now in South Korea. So I think we need to start anticipating these developments and, and look at technology really as a kind of, as a, as a global uh, phenomenon. The, the, the pace of um, dissemination now is so rapid. Um, so I, I hope that more people are moved to act and um, hope this has been useful for you, and um, maybe, I, maybe I can take some questions now, if you, yeah? Yeah? Uh, in the large cities in China, for example, how has life changed for young, uh, educated women uh, who do not want to become mothers right away, who want to get a job and have an economic future? Has it affected their ability to get a job, select good jobs. I understand they, uh, some husbands are selected based on how much money they make, that sort of thing. Well, uh, I mean, one of the, maybe one of the contradictory, but also one of the sad things about, about sex selection is that it is happening at a time when, when in urban areas, women are doing, women in Asia are doing very well and um, you know, becoming very successful. And have, I mean, you see very, um, I think more women, I'm not absolutely sure, but I think there were more women it, than men admitted to PhD programs in China this year. Um, and I mean, across Asia, so Taiwan, South Korea as well, you see this issue of many women um, uh, taking on professional careers and, and um, you know, kind of putting off marriage, not having kids, um, kind of the guys um, falling behind a little bit. Uh, similar to what's happening in, in uh, New York. I, I don't know if it's happening in Ann Arbor, but um, <laughs> uh, it is, you do see these things happening at the same time. And I would say for those women, yeah, the issue of, the issue of uh, marriage is becoming very commercialized in China and people demanding a house and a car, I don't, I, I don't know if that's, I would say that connects to to kind of materialism, um, and and maybe women in, in in cities can also be a little bit more demanding because because there are f uh, fewer women on the whole. But uh, by and large, I think the effects the effects of the gender imbalance are for women in rural areas and and in poor countries who are at risk of then being transported to, to the wealthier areas. I don't know if that 
Thank you. Oh, not that um, advertising is banned, but it's it's actually. Oh, sorry, I should repeat the question. So the the question was, um, I, I'm not sure I can capture all of it at <laughs> once, but that. So it's it's it's. Um, I portrayed sex sex selection as something that is a global issue, but on the other hand, when when it's uh, pop, it's still popularly seen as a um, kind of immigrant issue. So then your question is, I think, um, countries that mentioned Western countries that do ban PGD for sex selection and um, so what? Are they banning for a certain group of people? Are they banning for a certain group of people? Yeah, um, it's actually, um, I think Australia as well, then, so they, they're, they're considering it recently somehow, PGD for sex selection. But most of Western Europe, PGD is, is illegal. Um, I've, for, you're not allowed to do it for sex selection. Even if you want to do it for um, certain diseases and conditions, you, you need to go before a board. Um, it's not just freely offered. Um, that is, in, it's a, there's a complicated story there. I think in the West, the f fertility industry is, is very, the US fertility industry is exceptional with among Western countries. It, it's, um, it's kind of, it's been called the wild west of, of fertility treatments here. Um, that's in part because we have a private uh, healthcare system and, and because uh, fertility treatments have become a way to make money. Um, for for doctors, so if the state has to pay for it, they may deem um, something like selecting the sex of your of your child just because you want to, not in an important enough um, reason for them to pay. Uh, I, I do think also there, are, I think in Europe a bit more um, uh, hesitant about about going forward with some of these te techniques. Uh, I have heard of um, doctors in in the UK dis discriminating um, during ultrasounds based on how a couple looks. Oh, sorry. So um, denying um, in South Asian, uh, people of South Asian descent in particular, uh, are, are there are stories that they have trouble finding out the sex of their fetus if they want. Um, and, and I mean, I think it's, it's problematic for doctors to decide who looks and like they, they will select for sex. Um, uh, but this is a, it is an issue that's much more discussed in, in Europe. Uh, and in the US, um, sex selection unfortunately gets extremely wrapped up in the abortion debate. And it's, it's like, it, I think, become very difficult to disconnect the two. Um, that even because, it, this is actually another reason why, um, why uh, we, we kind of offer unfettered choice, consumer choice, when it comes to fertility, the fertility industry. And that's because in the 1980s, when these, some of these techniques were first being discussed and first being introduced, abortion politics were already so contentious that um, there was hesitancy about 
re reducing any, re putting any restrictions on what, what people might do during uh, reproduction, that it would set a precedent for curtailing abortion rights. So, yeah? Um, so I have a question about, I guess it's, it's sort of this key finding that you see in these countries like China, but also in other places around the world, the preference for boys. Because I understand, you know, the, the story that you're telling about there, there were these old values, then there was Western population control, and there was technology. But in most cases, I think we expect that the technology catches up with the technology comes as social values are changing. And so, like we, when we go to Shanghai and we say, well, in Shanghai, this really doesn't exist because people want boys and girls equally. And even in the West, where we say, uh, or I might think, this is objectionable that people choose for blue-eyed kids, I don't worry so much about the gender imbalance because I think that probably balances out. Some people want boys, some people want girls. So what explains still now in places like China or, or Korea, for example, the preference for boys? I don't really understand um, it if it's some, unless it's something old, you know, the, the old story about preference. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It. Um, well, I mean, the reasons, the specific reasons why people would want a boy vary from one place to the next. So, I mean, it could be that you want a boy to carry on the family line, or that. Um, sorry. The question. Sorry. The question. Did it, the question was. Um, so, why do, why do people want boys if this, um, you know, the te technology is introduced and enables them to get boys, but you know, there's uh, there's this underlying preference there and. Certainly, you have places where where people could freely use this technology, but it can kind of balance out, as in the U.S. Um, so, so what's happening? Like, why why do they want them? Um, the, the reasons vary from place to place. I mean, it could be carrying on the family line. It could be uh, the 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 son sweep sweeps your grave. Son performs ancestor rites when you're um, when you're dead. Um, it could be that. Um, the son is the one who would take care of you in old age, that the daughter would marry out, or um, in India that um, the, the reason often given is that the dowries have become very expensive and uh, have, have kind of skyrocketed in, a, in a recently, and um, that's made daughters very expensive. And um, those reasons are definitely there, and, and there are, um, I would say they're, they're just, it, you can read lots of books on them. There, I mean, there's a lot of research that's been done on this, and this is a. The, I mean, to, if you read articles on sex selection, often you'll get. If you read about China, you often get an explanation that talks about a son caring for the parents and an, about ancestor rights. And if you read about India, you get often the um, article about. Uh, the article will talk about dowry and the daughter being expensive, um, but. I felt that there was some, there is a kind of uh, global something happening that that was common to these different countries, and so I, I didn't go into that as much in in my book for that reason. I mean, it felt. Um, I think we had to explore then how has this happened in, in all of these places at once, and you know, sure, changing the values would definitely help. Like if, if people didn't value boys more than, than girls, you would not have a, 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 a skewed uh, sex ratio at birth. Um, on the other hand, I do think that this general issue of selection is one that has to be discussed because because um, whatever the prevailing values are in the world, uh, the, we could select in, 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 in favor of whatever's value. You know, if you, can, you have a, a world in the future where, where um, Girls are are much more valued. Um, do we let people se select for girls? And and there's some evidence that people are doing that in the U.S. Actually, um, is that I, I think just as a science reporter and as you know somebody interested in the bioethical discussions that go around go on around new technologies, uh, it, that some conversation has to be had. Um, and actually, those conversations did go on a, a little bit uh, in, in the by the 1980s. Um, in the 1960s, they were, <laughs> they were you were having like a, a totally different conversation. Um, and it, maybe if there had been more women um, involved in the in the population movement, and maybe um, you know more of a kind of bioethics framework for for discussing these. 
these issues that you would not have, you, we would have had a different result. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So she said, it seems like with the current trend, parents of boys may soon have to pay to get a get a bride. Um, but that that is happening in in, in some places. Um, dow dowries have gone down in some parts of India. I mean, a sociologist, there was a sociologist who told me this is one of the positive effects of the of the gender imbalance is that that in some cases women are the marriages are happening without dowry um, in, in places where they where they did before, uh, and you have women also being bought. Um, but I, I don't know. There has been a speculation that as women become scarce, um, economists in particular like to, to talk about this. That, you know, as women become scarce uh, in supply, the demand for them goes up. They become more valuable as a result, and uh, and and that's happened to a degree. But they, the the main problem is that they're not controlling their own value in in a lot of cases. So people are people are selling them. So. Um, in all these discussions of sex uh, uh, selective abortion, uh, sometimes I feel uh, whether the risk, demographic risks, are a little bit exaggerated. Uh, marriage has been quite universal in China and in other Asian countries, and much higher than in Europe for long, for centuries. So if marriage rate goes down a little bit, and that's not probably not unexpected, as you said, in, in big cities, in Taiwan, Korea, ma many professional women don't get married. So with time, maybe um, the normal universal marriage will change also. Another thing, the examples you give that uh, Taiwanese men have to marry the Vietnamese women, those um, uh, international, I don't know, transactions or marriage transactions may result more from the norm of uh, hypergamy than anything else. So a lot of high status women refuse to marry uh, equal le low status uh, men as women's social status increased uh, uh, tremendous, uh, dramatically over the, uh, over the decades. So you have so many PhD, uh, women with PhDs and college education, <coughs> they do have difficulty finding husbands. So you do have access problem in cities in, 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 uh, among professionals or women. So it's not numbers, it's not lack of women per se, it's just uh, another norm of hypergamy that prevents uh, universal marriage. Okay, so let me repeat the, the, the points. The first one is that, um, that Oh, that then maybe some of the the effects of of uh, sex ratio imbalance can be exaggerated because first of all, in in uh, China, you've had nearly universal marriage rates over time, and um, compared with the West, where we're now, you know, percentage of people who don't get married, and so in if a smaller portion proportion of people uh, get married in China, it may not be such a big deal. There's like, more room f to give. And and the second is that in uh, Taiwan and uh, Korea, um, the, the um, hypergamy, like women marrying up, women, uh, I'm not sure how pergamy plays in in this in this case, but that women are are going to cities, getting uh, more uh, professional careers, and and they are ha earning PhDs, having trouble getting married, and that that leaves uh, men in rural areas um, without wives, and so so there's other things going on there. Um, Oh, because I, yes, because the women with PhDs have trouble getting married. That's that's the issue. Um, so, <laughs> and that's definitely true. It's certainly true. And um, you have these other these other trends go on. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, I did speak with uh, I did speak with demographers in Taiwan who connected um, the the sex ratio imbalances as an, another factor that then contributes to to the. Um, uh, to men having trouble getting married, um, so I mean you have these other you have these other phenomena happening at the same time, and then and then you reduce the number of women on top of it. I mean I think it makes it very difficult. Um, and one thing that's 
I mean, one, I think one, one sad aspect of the sex ratio imbalance is that it is a people in the uh, urban areas or developing more middle class areas who select at first. And so it starts there. And then the people who might feel the effects would be the rural men um, or people in poorer countries. So it's not, it also kind of delays action to some degree. I mean, I think if you're, if you're, you, your son does not have trouble getting married, if you can still f find a wife from elsewhere or um, maybe not get married in your own city, it's not such an issue, then you know, maybe it delays people worrying about it for 10 to 20 years. Has anybody oh. considered the genetics over time? It just continues. Women are very bright, right? In a modern technical society, they will go for the brightest guy who has the high job. And this, in modern technical society, this is an intelligent guy. Mm -hmm. So this means that there will be taken out of the pool of men who produce the less bright men. <laughs> but over several generations, there is a chance to go to increase IQ. Okay, the question was, has anyone considered the genetics of this, uh, genetic effects of this, in that women uh, tend to marry up to hypergamy again, and tend to marry uh, more intelligent guys, brighter guys, and uh, pick the, 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 the better ones in the bunch? So if the worst men, worse, I don't know, less intelligent men cannot get married, then their, their um, genes will be out of the mix, and uh, <laughs> um, that over time, maybe we would become more intelligent. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if anybody's considered that. That's, that's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, the, the, the effects on birth rates were considered pretty early on. I mean, I found a discussion in, from 1970 at the, at the Population Association of America about what, what the effects would be, I'm assuming because women are the ones who reproduce. So what happens when you, when you, when you reduce that group um, and, uh, you know, turns out you have m much lower birth rates over time as a result. But uh, the effects on, on the intelligence of the human race, I don't know. I don't know. I have a question. Um, my question is that sometimes it doesn't matter, you know, whether a man or a woman is intelligent or not, but I'm just wondering if you could just talk a little bit about what uh, the overall global trends have been when the overall global economy is down and people can't find jobs and people can't, you know, people are not able to find jobs, but they, but, but they do have the, you know, desire to settle down, and, but, but because of the economy the way it is, what effect does that have on a mate selection and as a result, uh, sex selection of babies? Can you talk a little bit about the economy? Okay, so the question was what the, the effects of the economy on sex selection and, um, and whether when, when economic downturns has any effect on people selecting for sex. I, I am, not so sure. I mean, I could say that this is something that's happening in developing countries, um, but beyond that, um, yeah. You had a question? I think. Yeah. yeah. I, was um, I was wondering if people, because of the imbalance, if they start marrying younger and younger women, is there any data to support that? I noticed that in your example, where he went, he was 31, he he brought back a bride that was 20, and I was wondering then, as as the population of people of people your own age kind of diminished, do, you then see, do men then seek younger and younger women? Do we see that for marriage? Or women no. well, do you want to answer that? <laughs> kind of yeah. It go both ways. Yeah. Uh, age of marriage keeps going up for men and women, but the gender gap also uh, is getting bigger in the last 10 years. So you do see a widening gap between husband and wife for the last 10 years. But the reason is economic, social, not a demographics. Not because there's not enough women, but because uh, men have, are not established enough in their, the pressure for, for establishing a household is higher now. So they, they couldn't afford to be married uh, early on. And also, another is actually 
uh, Mara hasn't mentioned is also there's more tolerance towards premarital sex. That also cohabitation is on the rise. So a lot of people just live together without getting marriage license. That happens a lot in cities. Mm. Did you all hear that? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. In the yeah. So you didn't uh, uh, say anything about the possibility of uh, uh, that some of these men uh, will be gay. I mean, if it yeah. the 10 percent of men anyway are, mm -hmm. then 15 percent of men not having female counterparts becomes less of a problem. Uh, and uh, and there is a lot of evidence that anyway homosociality varies. The, the, the schoolboys in Eaton and so forth who spent 18 years with each other seem to have experimented with one another at a rate of about 30% uh, in, in, in mixed schools that doesn't happen so much. But uh, if you threw these 15% of men into society like this, you might actually have an increased homosociality uh, as a result of, of uh, social pressures and inability to find uh, women and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems to me that uh, your analogy to the Old West is flawed, I would say, as a historian, just because those were, uh, those were gender unbalanced uh, communities in a situation of low institutionalization, which had to do with the frontier. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm suggesting to you that, that the better uh, model for uh, understanding the future might be contemporary San Francisco. <laughs> 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 so the issue was um, have, that I didn't discuss uh, the issue of whether when you have uh, more, more men unable to find female partners, whether they would have male partners, um, whether, I think not whether more men would become gay, but whether more men would, would um, have sex with men. And that is something that is actually um, I've heard that gay groups in China are um, interested in. I talked to a demographer who said that she'd been approached from a, a GLBT group uh, about, um, like, they were very interested in research on the gender imbalance. Um, I, uh, you know, I think it's actually would have, would have, um, it would be a, a benefit for gay men who are who are now maybe face pressure to get married uh, to women, and um, it can be a lot of social pressure in in countries like China still maybe lessening, but but to kind of have a keep a, a marriage to maintain appearances. Um, on the other hand, so for those men, it could be a good thing. On the other hand. Um, could be negative for lesbian women who would then face more pressure to marry um, men or to, so I don't know. That's my speculation. I didn't actually, I didn't actually interview that group. I heard about kind of late in the process of my book, but yeah, it's a good point. Um, yep. Um, what, what, the question was, what are some policies that governments are, are implement, using to uh, confront the, the issue of sex selection? Um, there is a lot of uh, well, concern about the issue. I'd say in China and in India in particular, um, there, like the Caucasus countries, not really any recognition of the issue. Um, same with Albania. Uh, but um, also South Korea, v Vietnam have really recognized the issue in South Korea now, the sex ratio of birth is balanced, so it's not, not such an issue. But um, well, first of all, sex selection and um, also s sex d determination has been illegal um, since the 1990s in, in uh, both countries, in both China and India, I believe. And so it's illegal to know the sex of your baby. Um, I think in China it's not fully criminalized, but there is a, it, it is, you know, it is illegal. Um, a lot of people get around it, uh, <laughs> that's, which is the, the problem. And, and I think there's not much emphasis on enforcing the law. Um, but particularly in India, since the, the most recent census, census came out in the spring and showed that the, the sex ratio of birth is on the countrywide uh, went up, and also some 
uh, has spread to new states within India where where it wasn't so skewed before. And the government, there is, there's been a lot of, um, uh, in a lot of government leaders talking about what to do. Uh, there are all kinds of schemes to pay people to have girls. Um, I don't know that this is a great strategy by and large because it doesn't address maybe the, the issue of middle class parents who, who for whom a, a payment is not going to sway them one way or the other. Um, there are, there's an, in, the, the University of Bangalore, I think, offers a, a affirmative action for s uh, single daughters. So when they don't have a brother, you can assume that sex selection didn't happen. Maybe it did, but, um, uh, so it reserves places for those for those girls, and that I think is a, a policy that maybe is a bit more um, directed at the people who might actually uh, be selecting. So I think that kind of policy is is, is uh, has potential to to work. Um, by and large, though, I think maybe not so much. Uh, not so much um, initiative within the governments, but it is growing. There is a, I mean, the, the, the it def, each each census that shows that that it's getting worse or shows that it's uh, moving to a new area, that kind of, yeah, people get worried. Yeah. Actually, uh, one of the other things yeah, that the government has done is to tie uh, evaluations of performance to sex balance in the region. This is important because previously, performance evaluation is purely based on fertility. If it's high fertility a region, you get a low evaluation. And uh, as a result of that, there is an underreporting of new babies uh, in most uh, counties, rural areas. If there's high fertility, officials try to hide babies from statistical reporting system. So a lot of those underreported babies are actually girls. And a few years later, so every census, after 10 years, you find new babies uh, who uh, started to appear in the system at five, uh, age five and six, when they started to go to schools, they appear uh, in government statistics. And a lot of that's why there's a little bit of over-reporting um, over of sex imbalance, because babies are more likely to be underreported from year zero, especially z uh, year zero, but from zero to, to six uh, 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 for that reason. And because officials are afraid of reporting too many babies in their jurisdiction. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Matt. Um, I just wonder if you could tell us about the prices of black market sex discrimination and black market abortions in places where they're illegal in relation to incomes. How much? Um, so the question was what the how much it costs to get the uh, ultrasound and um, uh, get sex termination during ultrasound and abortion um, I had heard that it was uh, well, in Swaining where where uh, the, the place I mentioned earlier I'd heard the total cost was around a, a thousand yuan uh, this was a few years ago and maybe it's uh, maybe it's gone up I don't know if it's what it would be now that would be I don't know can anyone calculate the, the exchange rate quickly I haven't been in China recently <laughs> what 1,000 yeah 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 120, 130, yeah, 130 dollars. Um, so I, I don't know in in India. I'm not sure, um, and how how it would work or is it, if anyone in the audience have yeah. So in India, around two hundred dollars to get uh, detection, and yeah. Um, yeah, I also heard about people bribing the ultrasound technician in China with uh, cigarettes. 
with but a good like a case of cigarettes, good good cigarettes. Um, any one more question? I think we have time for. A rise in has it, the question is has there been a rise in infertility um, among women who've gone undergone? I can't answer. I can't answer that question. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, um, we'll stop here, but I want to thank Mark for her talk. Yeah.